Okay, perfect. Um, very ominous <laughs> sound. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, um, well, uh, thank you. Uh, I, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming here and listening to my talk. And I'd like to thank Sam again for giving me space to talk about my research into horror films and representation of grief. Um, because, you know, grief, horror, and healing sound like they can't be, you know, related somehow, but they are. Let me explain how. In the director's cut version of Midsommar, Christian asks Ula and Maya about the Ateştupan ritual, which takes place at the end of the life cycles of Arga people. His exact question is, and do you have a typical period of grieving? Is there a time when you mourn? And Ula's answer is a simple, yet so complex, we grieve and celebrate. This answer is designed to make us uncomfortable. That discomfort comes from our cultural and personal relationships with death. In his seminal work, um, Grief Counseling and Grief Therapy, William Warden, building on Professor Gordon Alpert's dictum in 1957, writes, each person's grief is like all other people's grief. Each person's grief is like no other person's, is like, um, some other person's grief, and each person's grief is like no other person's grief. This applies to the cinematic representations of grief as much as real life accounts. Out of the hundreds of horror films I watched for this project, none of them had the same representation of grief. Each had their unique twist in it that furthered my research Grief is undeniably present in horror films, even though horror scholarship and characters generally tend to ignore it. Horror scholarship, apart from a few works, has mixed feelings when it comes to grief. Either there is no mention of grief in works related to the genre, or scholars defend that there is no grief in horror films. Although my work is engaged with the horror cinema of the 21st century, grief has been ever present in the horror genre, and that was the reason behind my research. I wanted to prove that. The main, main, of, uh, the main aim of my work was to investigate the representation of grief in the horror films of the century and analyze the narrative and cinematic codes that are used to evoke grief by the contemporary horror filmmakers. This study uses the techniques of film analysis and utilizes genre theory and the tools of grief and bereavement studies. As grief is experienced differently across the globe and in various religions, I chose to limit mine to the horror films of the English speaking world. Five films were chosen to be examined closely due to their visual and textual relevance. Midsommar, Hereditary, Pet Cemetery, but of course 2019 version, The Woman in Black, and The Babadook. I would like to argue that these five films are the best representatives of the new era of grief in horror films which started in the 21st century. The turn of the millennium brought many things in a stride. However, the most related ones to my work are the rise in violent events in the past 12 years and the surge in public displays of mourning, such as 9-11 and the funeral of Princess Diana. Death was everywhere. It was on, on our televisions, it was on our computers, and finally, it was on our smartphones. There was nowhere to hide. These occurrences challenged us to look closer into our relations to death and grief. This, in turn, may have urged contemporary the film horror filmmakers to create cinematic memento mori, also known as a reminder of mortality, or deal with their own grief reactions by using the cinematic medium. As horror is one of the most culturally relevant genres and it always manages to keep up with the zeitgeist, it's no surprise that the genre is once again in the front rows of cultural change. This time, the change is a matter of life and death. The second aim of my work was to add to the incredibly uninhabited field of grief in horror scholarship. 
Well, this actually changed a bit because there are now two books on horror and grief. One, uh, one was published, one is about to be published. So it kind of changed, but still, um, when I started my research, there were basically, uh, apart from Suzanne Court's uh, theory relating horror films to guilt, Richard Armstrong's theory of mourning films as a genre, and Douglas Kesey's passing marks about some examples of grief in the 21st century horror films, no serious mention of anything related to loss, mourning, grief, or survivor's guilt was ever made in genre scholarship. And Noel Carroll himself calls horror characters always potential gris for the genre satanic mills and argues that the contemporary horror genre degrades his character to a person as meat, considering that he means the horror films of the 80s and the 90s as contemporary examples, these statements may have some truth in them. Nevertheless, even the films of the slasher period had in-depth representations of grief in them. The five chapters of my research are structured according to the prominent grief scholar, Elizabeth Kibler Ross's Five Stages of Grief. Although her work has been criticized for being too linear, she later explained in her book on grief and grieving that these stages are not meant to be set in stone and linear. It is possible to jump from stage to stage or not experience any of it. Each chapter focuses on a film and the related stage of grief. Chapter one, Denial, examines Ariasta's film, Midsommar, using the tools of grief and film scholarship. Chapter two, Anger, is devoted to an in-depth reading of hereditary. Chapter three, Bargaining, well, <laughs> is focused on the newest rem cinematic remake of Stephen King's novel of the same name, Pet Cemetery. Chapter four, Depression goes back to horror's roots in Gothic literature with The Woman in Black and takes a chilling look at the big supreme adaptation of Suzanne Hill's 1983 horror novel. Chapter five, Acceptance investigates the nature of grief in one of his most tangible portrayals in cinema, The Babadook. Various studies date the beginning of horror to Gothic literature. James Twitchell states that Modern works of artificial horror originated in the late 18th century, uh, discovery that by inducing extreme feelings of dreadful pleasures, both print and illustration could arouse that ex and exploit powerful feelings deep within the human spirit. Many scholars believe that the Gothic novel was born out of the Enlightenment repression, repression. As feelings were replaced by reason in the Western Europe, the creative passion found a way out in the form of Romanticism. And so the Gothic novel was alive. Death becomes a Freudian uncanny in the Gothic. Both familiar and unfamiliar haunted home um, grieving families, along with the otherworldly spirits, take center stage. Joseph and Tucker argue that the Victorian age is in mourning for lost fixtures in the world and of the spirit, which the acceleration of a coveted yet feared modernity had swept away. Even Queen Victoria herself is known for her very public grief in the aftermath of her husband Prince Albert's demise. This age's obsession with morbidity, decay, and mourning showed in both the culture and the works of art. Elizabeth Bronfen calls this phenomenon death by proxy because it happens to someone else through visual imagery or narrative. Horror as a genre rise up to the contemporary examples, works on a similar dynamic. The viewers experience things at a safe distance fear as well as, as grief. Although grief and horror has rarely been the subject of academic interest, there are exceptions. As I said before, Suzanne Court states that horror films focus on guilt and how it cannot be surmounted. Similarly, horror films that deal with grief are also well of in guilt, be it survivor's guilt or a parent's guilt over the accident that they could have prevented, don't look now gives us a grieving father that, you know, who deep down wishes 
he could have saved his daughter and on a subconscious level has a death wish because he cannot live with his guilt. As Cost points out, when a loved one dies, we not only experience our own deaths in an anticipatory way through this event, even, uh, and in a certain sense, we also die with him. Well, in, in Don't Look Now case, in the case of Don't Look Now, with, with her. The film that started the subgenre of psychological horror, Psycho's Norman Bates is so deep in denial about his mother's death that he borders on what Freud calls melancholia. According to Freud, mourning and melancholia are different. Difference is that the mourner remembers what they lost, but the melancholic does not know what they lost, only whom they lost. He believes that therefore melancholia is a pathological form of mourning, although grief scholarship is not entirely sold on that. One of the few examples of genre scholarship that touches on the subject of grief and horror is Richard Armstrong's mourning films. The scholar suggests that archaic fears and phenomena link the mourning genre to horror cinema. Fear of the dark, ghosts, primitive totems, resonating in the modern mourning film as dementia, hallucinations, and wait a minute, hallucinations and the susceptibility of children. All three can be found in the main films of this study. Grief, as it was previously stated, is ever present in horror genre. Slashers are notorious for their death rates. Even in the subgenre, the phantom of grief can be found. Friday the 13th gives the audience a grieving mother slash serial killer in the form of Mrs. Voorhees. She's as guilt-written as she's vengeful. She could have saved her boy if she only had heard his screams. Grief once again goes hand in hand with guilt. In the case of the death of a child, is, it is not uncommon to have long lasting feelings of guilt over not being able to prevent death. Scream may easily be the most self-reflexive reflexive, and also the bloodiest of all slashes, but the main theme and the monster of the entire franchise is Sydney's grief over her mother, Maureen. She's forever haunted by her mother's infamous legacy. It is not about if the film is not about his work of mourning. Why does everyone, including the killers, keep telling her she should just get over it? Why does she keep thinking about her dead friends in Scream 2? Why is Maureen's ghost shown in Scream 3? And finally, why is she named the angel of death in Scream 4 if the point is not to focus on her, on her grief and survivor's guilt? Although grief has been lurking in the shadows of horror for quite a long time, going as far as the Gothic, it has never been out in the sun as it is in the horror films after the millennium. It is now time to take a studies look into the heart of this study, the horror films of the 21st century. My first chapter, uh, as I said, it is much uh, research was structured across five chapters. And my first chapter is denial, and it focuses on Mitsoma. I can't anymore. Everything is black. Mom and dad are coming to goodbye. In the form of an email is how Mitsoma opens. Right off the bat, the film gives the audience uneasy feelings about death. It soon becomes apparent that Danny's bipolar sister killed their parents and then herself. And this was her suicide note to Danny. William Warden lists what he calls tasks of mourning as follows. Task one, to accept the reality of the loss. Task two, to process the pain of grief. Task three, to adjust to a world without the disease. And task four, to find a way to remember the disease while embarking on the rest of one's journey through life. Task one roughly correlates into what Kubler-Ross defines as the stage of denial. According to Warden, the first task of grieving is to come full face with the reality that the person is dead 
and that the person is gone and will not return. And that the amount of pain caused by multiple losses makes it Im almost impossible to deal with the workload of the second task. In Danny's case, she faces multiple unexpected and violent losses at the same time. Denial is her psyche's mechanism for protection against too much emotional pain. Danny also deals with the guilt that usually occupies the minds of survivors of suicide victims. Could I have done something to stop this tragedy from happening is the thought that swirls around her mind. When they all take mushrooms in Haga, Mark calls their group of friends family. Danny's trauma is triggered and she has a full-blown panic attack. She goes to the bathroom only to find her dead sister's depressed face in the mirror for a brief second. This is the manifestation of Danny's guilty conscience. As previously stated, this study is structured to the five stages of grief formulated by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her 1969 book on death and dying. This book, however, in contrast to popular, grief, popular belief, was not about the grief processes of survivors of the disease, but about the dying themselves. People with terminal illnesses suffer from their own grief, and Kubler-Ross wrote a book on this phenomena. Nevertheless, general interest in the subject urged her to write another book on the grief processes of people who lost loved ones, as these are different experiences. According to Kibler, Ross and Kessler, the denial stage in the dying is formed around disbelief. They want to believe that a mistake has been made and they are not actually dying, but the appearance of denial in the survivor of the disease is much more symbolic. Danny, after learning about the loss, calls her boyfriend Christian and lets out an agonizing and mournful scream. This is the initial shock. After an unstated time, which is assumed to be not long after her family's death, she joins Christian at a party. This gesture in itself and her decision to go to Sweden with Christian and his friends are signs of Danny not having a normal grief reaction, but rather a complicated mourning, which is described as a series of relational, historical, circumstantial, personality, and social factors, which, which make grief go wrong. Socially unspeakable losses, such as suicide, multiple deaths, and absence of a social support network, or having a complicated relationship with the deceased, are a few of the factors that cause complicated mourning. In the film, Danny inhabits all these factors which work for her disadvantage. Her sister commits murder, suicide of herself and both of their parents. Danny's partnership with Christian is by all accounts negligent and toxic. She appears to be surrounded by no friends other than Christian and his entourage. Her relationship with her now deceased bipolar sister was clearly a source of anxiety for her, as stated by Christian in the film. All these factors make her grief much harder to process. The Americans in the film are appalled by Danny's constant anxiety and her relation to death. On the other hand, the supposedly pagan community of Haga, including Pele, seems to be accommodating her knees as a grieving daughter and sister. They're not uncomfortable with talking about death. They hold many funeral ceremonies during the film that are akin to ancient funerary rites. They celebrate the life of the person. They mourn together as seen in the burning church scene and their holy book, Ruby Rudder has sections on grief. The only people who are negatively affected by the deaths and gore of it all are the Anglo-Americans in the film. Ari Aster points out, if anything, what ties them all together is a philosophy of mindfulness, staying connected to your life and to the people in your life and to the world around you, bring, being present to your life.
And being present is one of the main bases to accept death. Then she is elected the May Queen and is surrounded, surrounded by the adoring community. Danny, for the first time, sees her family dressed in traditional Harga clothes and celebrating with her. When one of the girls call her family, she doesn't flinch this time. She's not triggered. This is why she chooses Christian to be sacrificed for the ritual. She's not scared of death and grief anymore. And she now has a real family to depend on. She may seem mad, but she's no longer in denial. Well, chapter two, anger focuses on hereditary. Three of the films in this research include child deaths. One is hereditary and the others are pet cemetery and the woman in black. They all have an agonizing amount of rage and guilt. Guilt is a common feeling concerning the death of a child. Guilt springs from, could I have prevented this? And anger forms in the shape of, why didn't God prevent this? Or why couldn't I prevent this? The death of a child is still considered a taboo in cinema. Nonetheless, horror often achieves its greatest impact when it exposes or flaunts cultural taboos. Annie sleeps where Charlie used to sleep. Peter is guilt-ridden and he cries. Around the family, he does not show his grief. Annie makes a diorama of the scene of Charlie's death. To me, that diorama is a kind of a memento mori because it is a reminder of death and mortality. And when Steve's husband points out that this diorama might actually make Peter uncomfortable, and uh, because he caused the accident, and he shows no signs of understanding. She's possibly self-meditating by creating dioramas as these are known to help with you know, uh, grief and um, dep depression and anger. All this simmering rage comes to a tipping point at the dinner scene. Annie and Peter argue and Annie snaps into the now famous monologue. And I will recite that monologue for you. When, well, now your sister is dead and I know you miss her and I know it was an accident and I know you're in pain and I wish I could take that away from you. I wish I could shield you from the knowledge that you did what you did, but your sister is dead, she's gone forever, and what a waste if it could have maybe brought us together, something. If you could have just said, I'm sorry, or faced up to what happened, maybe then we could do something with this. But you can't take responsibility for anything, so now I can't accept, and I can't forgive, because nobody admits anything they've done. And at this point, Annie is red-faced with anger. Pete, Peter reminds her that she was the one who sent Charlie with him, turning the blame on her. Annie was probably already aware of this, and that was the cause of her anger as it was directed at herself as much as Peter. Warden states that in the loss of any important person, there is a tendency to regress, to feel helpless, to feel unable to exist without the person, and then to experience the anger that goes along with these feelings of anxiety. Kubler, Ross, and Kessler describe anger as a structure, and I quote, anger is strength, and it can be an anchor giving temporary structure to the nothingness of loss. At first, grief feels like being lost at sea, no connection to anything, then, you get angry at someone, maybe a person who didn't attend the funeral, maybe a person who isn't around, maybe a person who is different now that your loved one has died. Suddenly, you have a structure. Your anger toward them, the anger becomes a bridge over the open sea, a connection from you to them. It is something to hold on to, and a connection made from the strength of anger feels better than nothing. Annie's anger is her lifeline and her structure against nothingness. Another structure Annie gains is with the help 
of her friend Joan and spirituality. Joan invites Annie over for a seance. Armstrong makes a connection between a seance de cinema and a seance and elaborates on cinema's relation to death, spiritualism, and mourning. Mourning cinema's relation to earlier forms of spirit photography is fascinating, and the idea of the mourning genre being a spirit cinema is not far-fetched. Hereditary cinematography is reminiscent of a real-life diorama. Characters feel stuck in these tiny quarters, suffocated by their grief and rage. It is tonally much darker than Midsommar. In Midsommar, grief was denied, but in Hereditary, it is accepted to the point of anger, and now its shadows looms larger and darker. At the end of the film, the loss of Steve proves too much for Annie, and her body is fully possessed by Paimon, anger, grief. She completes the ritual, which transfers payment to Peter's body, and she cuts her for her own head. Well, that's the problem with anger. Easy to lose your head, right? Chapter three, bargaining, is about pet cemetery. Pet cemetery begins with its ending. This is not a common gimmick in horror films, as they pride themselves in their plot twists and surprise endings. On the other hand, we already know how this film ends due to Stephen King's novel of the same name in 1983 and the previous adaptation that was made in 1989. Nonetheless, there are a few major plot points that this film changes. The changes make the film much more relevant for this study about grief. The biggest change to the novel and the preceding adaptation comes in the form of the child who dies. Previously, it was Gage who met an early demise, but in this remake, a decision is made to kill off Ellie, the older sister. The, the director, Coach, explains the reasoning behind this alteration as such. The reason was that the older kid who was asking the questions about what happens when we die and what happens to our pets, that kid is the one who has the self-awareness to know what, had, what is happening to her. And she has the vocabulary to ask questions about it. Indeed, Ellie is, asks piercing and uncomfortable questions about her own death. The partner director, Dennis Widmeyer adds, Ellie has now come back and she has the mind to be able to understand that she is dead, that she died on the road that day. She can talk about death and almost psychologically torture Louis with those questions. Does mommy know about me? What are you going to tell her? Those sort of needling questions that, they re that really get under your skin. Those are the moments we kind of live for. And the director couldn't be more right. And these are precisely the questions that trigger grief reactions from Lewis as they remind him of what he lost and how he will never be able to get it back. The questions also remind him of his guilt. They are never asked in the previous adaptation as Gage is not old enough to be aware of his death. The producer, Matt Greenberg, explains that he saw Pet Cemetery as Stephen King's King Lear, and he wanted to convey the pain that Lear feels following the death of his daughter, Cordelia. According to Amy Simons, who plays Rachel in the film, you can't intellectually understand what grieving is until you go through it. Freud talks about it, that society functions on a level where you have to deny death and illness in order for society to function. And she continues, when you do talk about it around people that haven't experienced it, they sort of find you to be shocking when you actually discuss about the nuts and bolts of death. All these facts alluding to a deeper study of grief are what make this remake better suited for my research. Pet Cemetery is a clear example of the stage of bargaining. Lewis, being a man of science, does not believe in the afterlife as he states in the film himself. 
for him, death is final. When he actually comes face to face with the death of a loved one, he is struck by bargaining. Kubler and Ross, Kubler Ross uh, explains the stage as such. We want life returned to what it was. We want our loved one restored. We want to go back in time, find the tumor sooner, recognize the illness more quickly, to stop the accident from happening, if only, if only, if only. Guilt is often bargaining's, bargaining's companion. The if onlys cause us to find fault within ourselves and what we think we could have done differently. We may even bargain with the pain. We will do anything not to feel the pain. Lewis feels the guilt especially stronger because he was unable to save Ellie from the coming truck. In one scene, he tells Rachel, I wasn't ready to say goodbye to her. It's my fault that she died. I had to bring her back. To lose a child also means losing your hopes in the future as children symbolize a future for the family. They carry the genes and the lineage. The death, death of a child, therefore, stands for the disintegration of the family unit. The untimely demise of a child is specifically hard for fathers because they are, you know, socially uh, in a position to protect the family as a unit. Louis expresses his grief in the form of bargaining with death. In modern society, death is sanitized as loss. And even the society is unable to face up to biological facts such as decay. Therefore, the death of a loved one is perceived to be a void in our lives. Even a medical doctor like Lewis is not able to cope with the biological human demise when it concerns his own daughter. When Ellie returns from the beyond, Lewis baits her and her hair falls out and there's dirt all over her. She reeks of death. He still does not want to accept that Ellie died and this is something else. Starting from Church that Church was the cat in the film and the book, and Judd taking Louis to the Micmac burial grounds to bury the cat, something changes in Louis. Man is the only animal that contemplates death and also the only animal that shows any sign of doubt of his finality. And Louis starts questioning the finality of things. And when he finally learns and accepts his grief, it is too late and the entire family turns into the undeath because they can no longer live with the knowledge of what Louis did and what they lost as a family. The ambiguous ending points to an ambivalence at the heart of mourning, a tension between a wish to live among the living and a wish to live with the dead in a timeless eternal world is how Pet Cemetery ends. And my fourth chapter, Depression, is about the woman in black. The woman in black starts with three Edwardian era children jumping to their deaths. Someone who is assumed to be their mother veils off screen. Right from the start, the film gives the audience three taboo deaths and one grieving mother. This scene cuts to the protagonist, Arthur Kipps, dreaming about his wife and their wedding. The title of the film, The Woman in Black, is double exposed with her face. This alone hints at the connection between Kipps' deceased wife and our main antagonist, Janet Humphrey, also known as the woman, woman in Black. Both women depart from the world untimely, both of them are separated from their children, and ultimately both of them haunt Arthur Kipps. Douglas Kesey agrees with the sentiment. He says, given that Eel Marsh House with its flooded causeway is a symbol for Arthur's grieving mind, increasingly off from the living, and given that his, his, his investigation of the ghost woman is driven by concerns about his deceased wife. It could be that the woman in black and the woman in white, his wife, are psychologically interrelated. 
Kübler, Ross, and Kessler depict the stage of depression, depression as such. This depressive stage feels as though it will last forever. It is important to understand that this depression is not a sign of mental illness. It is the appropriate response to a great loss. And they continue. We withdraw from life, left in a fog of immense sadness, wondering and perhaps if there is any point in going alone, why go on at all? Arthur wakes up clearly depressed as he has a hard time waking up and getting ready for work. To get out of bed may as well be climbing a mountain. You feel heavy and being upright takes something from you that you just don't have to give. When Kip sees his son, Joseph gives him a drawing of Arthur, Joseph and his nanny, and his mother as an angel. When Arthur asks Joseph why he looks sad in the picture, Joseph's answer is, that's what your face always looks like. The depression does not end there. When Arthur goes to work, he is given a final warning by his boss, who is not happy with Arthur's work after the death of his wife. It is then revealed in a flashback that she died in childbirth. The film's visual atmosphere is dark, brooding, misty, and isolated. From the moment Arthur sets foot on the village of Cretan Gifford, there is an air of mourning and depression. It is slowly revealed to be about the tragic child deaths that take place in the village. Eel Marsh House itself looks decaying, deserted, and dead. Although written in 1983, The Woman in Black is a traditional Gothic ghost story set during the Edwardian era. The Gothic, as stated previously, has plenty of ghosts and mourning, and Eel Marsh, with all of his ghosts, sadness and despair, has the hallmarks of a Gothic haunted house. Costumes are an important part of the film, mainly the costume of the woman in black, because by the 19th century, black became the norm of mourning, the color speaking of the desolation within, as well as a sign of the deprivation of a life. Janet, for all intents and purposes, is a woman in mourning. Arthur, not so different from her, also dresses in full black attire through the entirety of the film. A melancholic response to loss, the symptomology of which is a severe, often suicidal depression, ensues when the object was loved, not as separate and distinct from oneself, but rather a mirror of one's own sense of sense and power, says Satna. And Janet is a definite example of this. She hangs herself after Nathaniel is taken away from her by her sister, Alice Trablow. Even in death, she looks for her boy, but mostly she wants to punish everyone by taking their children and making them her company in grief. This is obvious by the end of the film. Even though Arthur reunites with her, reunites her with Nathaniel, she still haunts Arthur, causing both him and Joseph to die. This scene may hint at survivor guilt, never going away until death. Arthur, his wife, and their son Joseph meet in death, guilt-free, griefless, and content. <laughs> Siri has other ideas in her mind. Okay, uh, Janet, the woman in black, stays in the shadows, an embodiment of grief that is ever so present. She is per grief personified. I mourn, therefore I am, is basically Janet's life motto, or me, death motto, <laughs> as you will. Chapter five, acceptance, is about the Babadook. And The Babadook is a very important film. It's, be, it's because uh, it's the film that made me start this research. I watched the film and I said, this is about something else. This is not just horror. This is something else. The Babadook opens with the protagonist and antagonist, Amelia, dreaming about a car crash. This event, which is later revealed to have killed her husband, Oscar, 
is dreamed about a few times in the film. According to Kareth, to be traumatized is precisely to be possessed by an image or an event. And Amelia is clearly possessed by this car crash and the consequent loss. There are several dream nightmare sequences in the film. Apart from the car crash, Amelia dreams about killing her son, Samuel, more than once. Dreams are a big part of mourning horror, as well as real life grief recovery. It is very common to dream of the dead person, both normal kinds of dreams and the distressing dreams or nightmares. All five films in this study have, have a dream sequence in them. In Midsommar, Danny, Danny has a nightmare about her friends leaving her behind. In Hereditary, Annie has a nightmare where she sets herself and Peter on fire. In Pet Cemetery, Louis dreams about Pascal, the patient he could, have, he could not save. In The Woman in Black, Arthur dreams about his deceased wife and their wedding. And finally, in The Babadook, Amelia has, has nightmares about what she lost and dreams about getting rid of the person whom she blames for that loss, her son, Sam. I argue that the main antagonist of the film is complicated grief. Shaped like a monster in the form of Mr. Babadook, monster is a critical part of the horror genre. Robin Wood explains the basic formula to a horror film as such. Although so simple, the formula provides three variables, normality, the monster, and crucially, the relationship between the two. The definition of normality in horror films is in generally, general boringly constant. The heterosexual monogamous couple, the family and the social institutions that support and defend them. The monster is, of course, much more prosaic, changing from period to period as society's basic fears clothe themselves in fashionable or immediately accessible garments. Rather, as dreams use material from recent memory to express conflicts or this desires that may go back to early childhood. It is the third variable, the relationship between the normality and the monster that constitutes the essential subject of the horror film. The monster that Robin Wood depicts is a stone's throw away from Mr. Babadook. He is cloaked in denial, anger, bargaining, and depression. All stages of grief come up at one point in the film. In a post 9-11 world, the recent memories and fears of the society look like Mr. Babadook. The Babadook is a perfect example of why one should look more into the 21st century horror films. They represent the monsters of the century and this research argues that one of those monsters is grief and our inability to deal with it healthily. Towards the end, Amelia tries to kill Sam, but in return, he caresses her face, an act of love and support. This gesture and Mrs. Roach's previous heartfelt monologue in which she lets Amelia know that she's there for her, help Amelia fight back the grief as a monster. Still, the Babadook comes after Sam. This time, Amelia stands up to the monster. She finally accepts that she's not well and she should fight for her family. What do you want, she asks the monster. She sees a flashback of Oscar saying, keep breathing, and Amelia starts wailing. This is her facing her trauma, but also realizing her capacity to love and keep afloat. You are nothing. This is my house. You are trespassing in my house, she tells the monster. The monster gets bigger. If you touch my son, I'll fucking kill you, she continues, unafraid. When the monster goes for Sam one last time, she screams aloud, no, and the monster gets smaller and smaller until it's just some clothes on the floor and a low growl. It escapes to the basement. The next time the audience sees Sam and Amelia is when they have Sam's party on his actual birthday. 
which is something that uh, happens for the first time because, as, as I said before, uh, the husband, Oscar, dies on Sam's birthday. So for Amelia, it is something that triggers her uh, trauma. So she never, she never celebrates Sam's birthday on his actual day. But this time they do. They play happily. Mrs. Roach is with them. Amelia is open to talking about Oscar and sees the similarities between Oscar and Sam, which she avoided until then. They keep Mr. Babadook in the basement. They feed it. They tend to it like it's a helpless baby. Am I ever going to see it? Sam asks. One day when you're bigger, Emily answers. It is grief as Sam has to deal with his own grief that he grows up. When Amelia comes back up from the basement, she utters these words that could be said by anyone experiencing grief. It was pretty quiet today. Sam retorts supportively, it's getting much better, mom. It will get much better, but it will never go away. Well, thank you for uh, listening to me. Uh, and um, I'm looking forward to the questions. I hope that this uh, look into the new era of horror and grief healing opens up exciting discussions. Thank you guys for listening.